All right, we might make a start. Good morning to you all. Thank you for coming along to support our summer scholars this morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on this morning. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Tom Rogers and I am a historian here at the Military History section at the Australian War Memorial. I carry out research on frontier conflict, overseas colonial contingents, the Boer War and the First World War, but I also coordinate the Summer Scholars Program. Now, since 1985, the military history section here has hosted 101 young historians under the Summer Scholars Scheme. So we've got our 100th scholar coming up uh, this morning. And the scheme has provided them with practical experience of working in a major historical institution. Each scholar is paired up with an academic supervisor from our section. The key difference though between our summer scholar program and similar programs around Canberra is that when our scholars arrive, we actually give them the project. So they don't bring their own project with them uh, from externally and they don't choose their own project. And in fact, in most cases, we give them a project that is outside of their usual uh, area of research. So what that means is that what you're hearing this morning uh, will be the outcome of six weeks of intensive archival research. And I think, well, I hope you'll agree with me that the results are very impressive. I'd like to uh, extend my thanks on behalf of the section to Andrew Curry from the Research Centre who helped our scholars uh, get around in the, in the archives, uh, to the travel officers, uh, Kira Hopkinson and Christy Koch, to Anne Benny, the Assistant Director of Public Programs, and to the Acting Director, Brian Dawson, uh, for their continued support of our program. <coughs> so this morning, I'm going to introduce each speaker, uh, each scholar. They're going to speak for 20 minutes. Then there'll be about 10 minutes of question time after each uh, scholar has spoken. If I can ask you, when you do ask a question, to speak into the microphones, which will be roving around the theatre. All right, our first speaker this morning is Tandy Wang, whose project I supervised. Tandy joins us from the Australian National University, where he is about to go into his honours year in history. Working with Tandy on this project has been a pleasure. He's challenged me and inspired me to think about my own approach to historical research. And he su suggested new ways to look at the Australian uh, contingents to the South African War and how we tell that story as historians uh, in the present. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Tandy to come on up and tell us what he's been researching. I was not at all expecting that extremely lovely introduction, so very flushed in gratitude. In 1989, when the Australian War Memorial began preparations for its Boer War exhibition, it proposed the tentative title Bushman and Boer. Thirty years later, I have reappropriated this evocative phrase in my presentation, not only because of its elegant alliterative appeal, but also because it gestures to interesting questions about how Australians understood themselves, their British allies and their Boer enemies. Banjo Patterson, the famous Australian poet and, at the time, the Sydney Morning Herald special war correspondent, wrote in 1899 that, We think of the Boers as semi-savages, but we have plenty of people just as rough as they are. They are square, sturdy men, much the type of our Bushmen. In this statement, Patterson effectively beat me and my illustrious curatorial predecessors to the punchline. Australians, he noted, were Bushmen, but we are left to wonder, did this have the effect of making them indistinguishable from Boers? Today I'm going to look at the story of white Australian identity in the complex interplay of British imperialism, nascent Australian nationalism and transnational race thinking as expressed by Australians on the veldt. The South African War was a conflict self-consciously understood by both British and Boers as a quote-unquote white man's war. Scholars such as Marilyn Lake and Henry Reynolds have shown us that whiteness, not merely Britishness, was a crucial identity category in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Fittingly, 
The Australia which entered into this conflict would, upon federation in 1901, make one of its first legislative acts the implementation of what was known as the White Australia Policy. Given this, what are we to make of the claim by the Australian A.G. Hales, correspondent for the London Daily News, who wrote that the Boers were the sons of semi-white savages? If Bushmen and Boer were as rough and savage as Patterson's quote above suggests, did that make white Australians semi-white too? Almost 120 years later, it can be easy to see the race relations of the British Empire as uncomplicated because they are such a far cry from what many of us believe today. But identity categories are never clearly fixed, and in those uncommon instances in which they are explicitly expressed, they show themselves to be always contested and shifting. In this presentation, we will see how some of these tensions played out in the accounts written by Australians in this white man's war. It is no coincidence that the South African War is such a fascinating case study for the intersection between cultural and military history. The South African War, also known as the Boer, or the Anglo-Boer, or the Second Anglo-Boer War, began in October of 1899 and broke out between two Boer republics, the South African Republic, commonly known as the Transvaal, and the Orange Free State, against the British Empire, which composed, was composed of the Cape Colony and Tal in Southern Africa. The ostensible reason for the war was to protect the rights of British subjects in Boer territories, but as with any conflict, there were more complex geopolitical concerns at play. Despite, despite facing initial setbacks, the British rapidly conquered the Boer Republic's key cities, but subsequently faced with a protracted guerrilla war, they infamously implemented a brutal scorched earth policy in concentration camps, eventually bringing the war to a close with a British victory in May 1902. In total, Australia offered 38 contingents to the conflict, with around 12,000 soldiers enlisting for an Australian unit, a number which goes to 16,000 if you count repeat enlistments, and possibly as high as 20,000 if you count Australians who enlisted for non-Australian units. This war then takes on an interesting identity question. Both sides of this conflict were colonial polities, that is groups of European settlers fighting each other on African land. And both groups, as if recognising this reality, supported the notion that this war was to remain white. In Natal, for instance, a minute from the Prime Minister to the Governor in February of 1900 noted that the war was, quote, a white man's war in which Africans should take no part beyond defending themselves and their property. In 1902, South African Republic, South African Republic statesman Jan Smuts similarly reflected that there was in Africa a, quote, special tacit understanding which forbids the white races to appeal for assistance to the coloured races in their mutual disputes. Of course, the white man's war was more a normative prescription than an empirical reality. The past 50 years of scholarship has done much to highlight in particular the significant extent to which Africans were involved in and impacted by this conflict. One casual example among many being evident in these photos of my servant and my groom found in Captain Murray's records. And in Australia, we're only beginning to understand through the fragmentary evidence, the involvement of Aboriginal service people in this conflict with at least nine identified individuals. What's important then about this label, white man's war, is not that it was accurate, since it wasn't, but that it speaks to the attitudes of many of those entangled in empire, and suggests that for all the many complex reasons that states, nations, and individuals go to war, identity was inextricably bound up in that process. For most people, the first and obvious identity question for this conflict might be, who did Australians fight for, Australia or empire? On this point, a whole heap of scholarship has been written that plunders parliamentary debates to piece together the nature of Australian support for this conflict, so my research angle is rather different. Rather than asking whether the decision to send troops reflected the Australian people's support for empire or not, I've engaged with the writings of soldiers and war correspondents who made the active decision to go to the front. This is a skewed sample, to be sure, but one which gives us a sense of the kind of conceptual tools available to Australians to express their beliefs in or justification of war. And what I found was largely unequivocal evidence that the involvement of Australians in South Africa was steeped in the symbolism and iconography of empire. This image on my left is an exemplary instance which I discovered in a private record in the War Memorials collection. It's a poster that was given to the departing New South Wales contingent in 1900, with the except, um, but with the exception of the title, An Australian to Australians, there is hardly a uniquely Australian thing on it. It is, after all, labelled at the bottom, a British square. The Australian flags that are at the top 
are surrounded by those of the other colonies superimposed on a Union Jack. Those flags are then linked together with a red line around the border, representing the crimson thread of kinship. And in case by looking too closely you miss the overall point, the entire frame is then adorned with the famous phrase of the British military legend Lord Nelson, England expects every man will do his duty. If you think this analysis is a bit overkill, I assure you it's not, because these symbols are explained in lengthy detail on either side of the image. So the iconography and symbolism of empire was everywhere in the accounts I examined. But equally prominent was a widespread citation of traits and characteristics that are still regarded as integral to the Australian character today. This may come as a surprise for some particularly ardent devotees of Charles Bean, the official historian of the First World War, who is reputed to be the creator of the Anzac legend. But Australians, so the creators of our Boer War sources say, were egalitarian, initiative-taking, and natural soldiers long before the Anzacs touched down on Gallipoli. In a romantic comment that gives Bean a run for his money, the Daily Telegraph correspondent Frank Wilkinson wrote, the Australian soldier is a tall, raw-boned, good-natured beggar. He can make tea in a period that an ordinary man would be striking a match. He can ride horses that tie themselves up into knots and buck with great suddenness and power. He can swear so that I have seen regular Tommies stand agape in awesome admiration. With a sick comrade, he is tender as a child. He is the sort of stuff that heroes are cut from. In his physicality, his soldiering skills, uh, especially his horsemanship, his down-to-earthness and his love of his mates then, the Boer War sees the emergence of a proto-Anzac legend. And, as alluded to above, this emerging identity was often set against none other than the British soldier, often given the nickname Tommy Atkins. This image, also from Wilkinson's book, captures that stereotype very clearly, with the British Tommy on the left uh, and the colonial on the right. Melbourne Herald correspondent Major W.T. Ray wrote that, Victorian men have proved not only that they can be as gallant in the face of the enemy as the best British troops, but a good deal more useful than the bulk of them. He has a higher intelligence than the average Tommy can pretend to, which is freely conceded by every British officer worth talking about who has seen them at work. These were not racially neutral claims. In his now iconic 1981 text, Inventing Australia, the historian Richard White argues that debates abounded in the 19th century about what was done to the quote-unquote British stock when it was transplanted to Antipodean shores, with competing conceptions of racial degeneration against racial invigoration. As White summarises, for many British in the 19th century, there was an urgent question, quote, when transplanted to other parts of the world, did the Anglo-Saxon racial type continue to progress or did it degenerate? This notion of Australian racial development in a new environment predicated on a successful British base was also common in the sources that I read. Private Otto Tetschau recorded in his diary a small poem that in many ways encapsulates these themes. And could you think we forget brave sons and mean to let their glorious memories fade after their work midst thundering of the guns when to the Boers the courage they displayed proved that Australia's sons upon the field were of the old stock, never known to yield. Nationalism and imperialism are often regarded in an oppositional relationship, as if you can't have one without the other. As I suggested above, the proto-Anzac of the Boer War defined his manliness at least partly in opposition to the British soldier. But poems such as Tetchars highlight that they were not really oppositional at all. For many Australians in the 19th century, and indeed to still a number today, Australianness, for all that made it unique, was made great because of its foundation in British race and heritage. How could these then, the valiant offspring of the great British Empire, possibly be compared to the Boer enemy? I found regular caricatures of Boer soldiers much less common in Australian writing than is suggested by the scholarship on British propaganda. But the images of Boers I did find in Australian writings made liberal use of the phrase savage and typically fixated on a small range of themes including Boer religiosity, physicality, treachery, ignorance and laziness. The, uh, the latter two, treachery and laziness in particular, might be familiar for those who have studied European colonial perceptions of indigenous peoples. Accounting for why he believed the Boers did not attack British forces at night, Banjo Patterson concluded, the fact is they are too lazy. They have never done any unpleasant work. When any hard work presents itself, all their lives they have been accustomed to send a native to do it. So now, when they might cut us up seriously by night attacks, 
they prefer to go to bed. One wonders whether Patterson deferred to this somewhat spurious claim because one alternative explanation, perhaps that the Boers were honorable or honest, would contradict their regular depiction as treacherous. In my research, I found a number of sources which spoke of supposed acts of Boer deception. A common one was the idea that the Boers abused the white flag, but a more interesting, albeit less common claim, was the role of Boer women in either luring British soldiers into their homesteads where they would then be ambushed, or using their charms to gain intelligence. In a rather humorous anecdote, for example, Albert Marshall expresses his delight in his new girlfriend, a little Dutch girl, but notes, I have to be very careful when I go there because they often try and pump me and want to know where all the British columns are, but I am too cunning for them. I always say I don't know. But if some characteristics like laziness and lying were said to set apart Australians from Boers, there were others that could create a surprising similarity. In the first instance, there was little that physically distinguished Bushmen and Boer. J.H.M. Abbott, Corporal the First Australian Horse, recounted his first vision of Boers in the following way. Boers, Boers, these men Boers? Oh no, they could not be, surely. Where were the brutal faces of the English illustrated papers? Where were the wild men from Borneo kind who we knew well were the only genuine Boers? Indeed, Australians probably physically resembled the Boers more than they did the stereotypical Tommy. Hales, who, I'm, who I quoted earlier, wrote that the Boers were dressed in all kinds of common farming apparel, just such a crowd as one is apt to see in a far inland shearing shed in Australia. And Patterson told the following anecdote. The Australian bushmen are a rough lot of diamonds to look at, but the English officers say that they are not real bushmen, don't you know? I fancy their idea of a bushman is much like our old idea of a boar, a sort of hairy savage who lives on horseback, and they don't think the men they have got are wild enough to be the real thing. These quotes refer to more than physical similarity. They point to the conception of the Boers as a group of settlers who had been transformed by the process of being colonists, particularly in, to European eyes, a very harsh environment. The Boer was rugged and masculine, lived on a horse and didn't shave. He was, as Hales noted, just the type that you would see in the Australian bush. The extensive diarist Major Joseph Dallimore wrote that the English settlers expect to be spoon-fed by the British South Africa Company, but the Dutchmen looked to their own efforts. Melseta is the most prosperous place in Rhodesia and is wholly a farming place, and the population are all Boers. It is no wonder they are a hardy race. The difficulties they've had to contend with would have frightened any other race. This was a crucial factor in the comparison between Bushmen and Boer. As I have already suggested, many 19th century white Australians were interested in the question of what became of the British race in the Australian bush. Yet it was the bush that was a linchpin of Australia's nationalist iconography, both in these accounts from the early 1900s and for many decades after. And it was this idea that motivated the concept that in a guerrilla war, the empire required sturdy colonials who knew how to fight with initiative rather than discipline to ride across the plains rather than march in rigid order. The Bushmen, in the words of the chaplain James Green, who traveled with the Australian Bushmen contingents, would play the Boers at their own game. Abbott put it succinctly in the opening chapter of his account of the war. From the history of the Dutch people in South Africa, their hardships and struggles as pioneers in the first place, and their open air, half civilized existence nowadays, it was a matter of universal opinion throughout the colonies that the Boer should be met by men who resembled him. Abbott would not, of course, accept that the Bushman was actually the Boer, and he insisted that whatever other similarities, quote, we do deal with more truthfulness than do the Boers. But his sentiment is highly indicative. Australians who were engaged in a sometimes tense relationship between an emerging national identity and fierce expressions of empire loyalty were also engaged in another tension, that of denigrating an enemy in battle, but also recognizing uncanny similarities. By way of conclusion, I wish to issue some caveats. In this research, I have looked at all the published Australian accounts of the Boer War that I've been able to identify, written in the 1900s that are held by the War Memorial. And I have supplemented these by looking at a number of the private records that we hold. Over 12,000 Australian soldiers served in the Boer War, the War Memorial, however, only holds 291 private records, and as you can see, I've been able to examine even fewer. My approach has not been to find out what the Boers were really like, 
uh, obviously, or even what the popular perception of Boer necessarily was. The complex ways individuals think about identity are not really generalisable, and with fragmentary evidence, certainly not generalisable in any rigorously positivistic sense. My cultural history approach instead has examined this topic by looking at the range and nature of discourses, concepts and symbols that structured how people articulated their and others' identities. In this way, we can critically analyse biases, images, stereotypes and caricatures to give an impression of the ways people framed and conceptualised their worlds. Certainly, not everyone was thinking about these concepts, at least actively. Many soldiers' diaries, such as the one transcribed above, were more often than not about everyday things like the time of the Reveille or the place they'd camped out, short and inexpressive. When people did engage in identity talk, they did not produce totally consistent or coherent ideas either. Constructions of the other never are. Abbott captured this sentiment perfectly in a humorously ironic comment that although being in South Africa awakened in him the realisation that we, the English the, and the Canadians and the Australians, were a race that overran the globe, he had to admit, heavens, does it take all of us to crumple up two little Dutch republics lost in the middle of a great continent? The British were simultaneously the glorious empire dominating the world and the effete Tommy in need of rescue. The Boers were both the treacherous semi-civilised colonists who needed to be crushed and the hardy masculine horse riders of the Welt. In piecing together this history, I've attempted to show a kind of discussion about identity and war that was quintessentially 1890s in its fixation on Britishness, race and the nature of settler colonists. And indeed, as we're in 2020, I think it is somewhat impossible for us to view a conflict known as the white man's war without critically interrogating some aspects of its identity questions. In this respect, my use of the phrase Bushman or Boer might do a little more now than it probably did when the War Memorial was thinking of using it in 1989. For, as I've shown, its simple but appealing dichotomy belies a far more complex and multi-layered history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tandy. That was fascinating. Uh, I'll open up the floor to questions. And when you do ask, please speak into the microphone. Thank you. All right. Okay. Hi. Hi. I was just wondering, when you were looking through the di diaries, mm. what, did you find any indicators that the troops keeping the diaries thought that doing that was another way they were above the ball, even though they may have been similar when it came to fighting and conditions, but did similarly the act of keeping a diary was another way they were more civilised than the mm. ball? Or? That's an interesting um, speculation. I didn't find personally that anyone noted, look at me, I am writing a diary, I am so great. Even in these rough conditions, I am able to maintain the standards of literacy. So I didn't find anything like that, um, but I... Um, yes, and I think uh, for a lot of diarists, it was, um, uh, as kind of indicated by this image, it was a kind of, um, here's what happened, I woke up today at six and I had supper at eight, the food was terrible and I went to bed at this time. Um, and so, yeah, actually I, th I think we can, it's, it's difficult to kind of untangle these aspects of identity because people often don't um, articulate them even if it is in the background of their mind. So that's an interesting idea, but it's not something that I actually encountered in, in the sources. Thanks very much, Tandy. Um, do you have any sources by women, Australian women? I don't have any sources by women. And so that's an interesting question. Um, the, um, there were, there were uh, like nurse contingents that were sent to the Boer War and scholarship, particularly outside of Australia, has really emphasised the role of women, particularly Boer women, in fostering Africana nationalism or nascent Africana nationalism and being an important part of... Um, uh, yeah, spurring the maintenance of that, um, of that conflict. Um, so there is an emerging feminist historiography and women's historiography, but I personally did not use or really encounter um, any, any sources written by women, with the exception of perhaps um, there was one instance, Major Dallimore's mother's diaries are also transcribed in, in conjunction with his. But um, I believe there might be one or two private records from nurses in the collection. Right. Right. Um, yes, but I didn't um, personally encounter them, no. Uh, 
but thank, for, thanks for that point. I think it's also um, important to, I guess, um, remember that um, it was a white man's war um, in its construction, not a white person's war. And so masculinity obviously plays a really important part as well in the ways that people were thinking through their identity. So it was both racialized and gendered. Hi, Tandy. Um, you mentioned early on in the piece that the, the native African um, didn't, wasn't inherently involved in the fighting aspect, but did you find much in the way of the support roles? Uh, you mentioned the, the servant and the groom yeah. uh, photos there. Did you find much in that regard as how what roles were they involved with? Mm, um, yeah, certainly. I think... There's been a big movement in the past since the 80s um, to recognise the involvement of Africans in the war. And part of it is also recognising that although technically they were meant to be scouts or auxiliaries in, you know, um, orderlies and so forth, that some of them were armed and people were involved in defending their own lands. Um, so um, certainly um, there, that is an important aspect of the war. In terms of the sources that I encountered, um, not particularly... Um, what I found most striking, actually, is how um, when when um, Africans are mentioned in Australian sources, they're often in single line anecdotes. It's kind of like, I have this funny story. My orderly, um, you know, we often make fun of this guy in the camp, and now my orderly calls the horse by that name. And it's kind of those kinds of anecdotes that are sometimes meant to make a broader comment about the you know the, the quote unquote nature of the native, um, but sometimes it's, it is really just quite cursory. Um, but I think once you pay attention to that fact, you realise that um, um, Africans were heavily involved in the war. And just because you don't have these extended passages about them in, from Australian soldiers anyway, um, they are, their presence is very much within those sources, even if it's not particularly elaborated. Yeah. OK, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Tandy. Our next scholar this morning is Nicholas Dickey. He joins us from the University of Wollongong, um, where he's just completed his honours year in history, and he's looking to, probably in the middle of this year, to enrol in a PhD also at Wollongong. Um, so Nick chose, Nick was given a project, obviously, on the, on the desert Air Force in the Second World War, but he chose to make it difficult for himself by focusing on the ground crew uh, and the people who weren't flying the planes. So let's have a look at what Nick has found. Yes, because you've got to live life on the edge when you do something like this. <laughs> Uh, the Mediterranean and North African theatres presented Australia with major experiences during the Second World War. Between June 1940 and May 1943, Australian forces served on the ground, at sea and in the air, from Syria and Lebanon, uh, mainland Greece and Crete in the east, to Tunisia and Libya in the west. The Royal Australian Air Force, or RAAF, had several squadrons serving in this desert war, and the histories today are mostly told by the pilot's perspective, or from the pilot's perspective. But what about the people who were on the ground? How did the RAAF ground crew experience the war? These were some of the questions I set out to answer during my time here as a summer scholar. In this presentation, I will break down the various roles played by members of the ground crew, their accounts of life in the desert, and the challenges they faced during the course of the war. This paper will present a clear image of daily life and the working conditions for these unsung heroes. The historian Simon Ball wrote that the war in the Mediterranean was simultaneously fought for, in, and to escape the Mediterranean. In 1940, the hope was that a swift Allied offensive on Axis forces that were already operating in the region would push the war back into Europe, essentially to escape. It also became clear that victory in the Mediterranean would influence the fate of the war. For the Allies, it would allow them to invade Italy in 1943 and attack Germany from its southern borders. In regards to the Desert Air Force, its primary role was essentially to support Allied armies with um, protection from above and deal damage to on the enemy from their vantage point in the sky. 
They provided protective covering and escorted bomber planes to target zones, as well as conducting tactical reconnaissance, naval patrols, and strafing, which is essentially attacking uh, enemy forces from a low altitude. Uh, Australians served not only in the RAAF squadrons, but also as part of the RAF alongside British and Commonwealth Airmen. Numbers 3, 450, and 451 squadron to RAAF were fighter squadrons, while numbers 454, 459, and 461 squadron RAAF were bomber squadrons. I've chosen to focus my research on numbers 3 and 450, as they were the most abundant in the memorials collection and were the longest serving RAAF squadrons in the Desert War. Number 3 squadron was the first Australian air squadron to conduct operations in the Desert War. Arriving in Egypt on the 23rd of August, 1940, uh, and commencing operations on the 13th of November. Initially, the squadron served in an army cooperation role until January 1941, when it was redesignated as a fighter squadron. They began to follow the front line as Allied forces pushed into Libya, making it as far as Benghazi, before having to retreat during Rommel's first offensive. The squadron was then sent east to participate in the invasion of Sicily, as in the invasion of Syria from June until August 1941. They returned to Egypt in September 1941 to, to participate in the Allies' second offensive pushing west. And during this time, the squadron was re-equipped with Curtis P-40 uh, Kitty Hawks. As you can see, this was the sixth and final time that the squadron was re-equipped. But the change meant that they had better aircraft. To put it in perspective, the Kitty Hawk was 145 kilometers faster at its top speed than the Gloucester Gladiator. Number 450 Squadron had a rocky start to the Desert War. When they arrived in Egypt on the 3rd of May 1941, they had no aircraft. And from June to August 1941, they were subsequently merged with the RAF's 260 Squadron, who had planes but no ground crew. It was not until January 1942 that the Squadron, who then were operating as a training and maintenance unit, were re-equipped with Kitty Hawks and began operating as a fighter squadron on the 19th of February. By June, not 450 Squadron was moving to the same airfields as Number 3 Squadron, operating together under the 239 wing of the RAF. Both Australian squadrons remained on the front line in the Desert War, participating in both the first and second battle of El Alamein in 1942 and the eventual push into Tunisia in 1943. When the Desert War concluded, both number three and 450 squadron moved to Malta to assist in the invasion of Sicily and Italy, which commenced as of July, 1943. Now the primary role of the ground crew in these Australian fighter squadrons was keeping the pilots and their aircrafts flying and functioning at their best. To this end, the most prominent roles were those directly attached to the maintenance of the planes. Each aircraft had a designated crew of up to four men, two of which would be the airframe fitters. It was their job to maintain all aspects of the aircraft, except for the engine and electrical instruments. In describing his daily work life, Sergeant Leon Henry claimed that the general service for a Kitty Hawk that returned from operations and had received no damage could take up to 30 minutes, checking oil, glycol, hydraulics, tyres, wheels and brakes. The refuelling and re-oiling was conducted by the engine fitters. Refuelling started out as a primitive process, according to Flight Sergeant John Tom using only a funnel, but became a lot more streamlined when fitters began engineering pumps. These fitters were also tasked with replacing engines, as you can see above. Tom described it as an awkward and delicate job in desert conditions. Uh, engine fitters also conducted morning inspections to ensure that planes were fully serviced and ready for operations. This included cleaning windows and mirrors and removing birds that had made nests in the radiators of idle aircraft. Other jobs were not designated to one specific plane. Wireless operators, for example, were tasked with maintaining all electrical components on up to 20 aircraft dispersed across an airfield. They also conducted more thorough servicing of all equipment when a plane had reached 30 flying hours. Also among the ancillary personnel were the armourers, whose job it was to make sure that every aircraft took off from the airfield armed to the teeth. The Kitty Hawks, for example, were armed with six 50-inch M2 Browning machine guns and three bombs a 500 pound bomb on the plane's center line and two 250 pound bombs on under each wing. Now in letters and diaries, one of the most respected jobs among the ground crew was that of the cooks. Bully beef, mash and vegetables were a staple meal in the desert. 
Squadron leader Bobby Gibbs wrote that the role of the cook was the most strenuous and heartbreaking, a thankless business even in fine weather. They were the first to rise and the last to go to sleep, having to prepare meals at any time of day and night. This had to continue even in howling sandstorms, where the fire was consistently being extinguished, particles penetrated everything, and serving personnel often left bully beef stew with a gritty, sandy taste. Sergeant Felix Sainsbury, a member of the armament section, declared his utmost respect for these cooks, claiming that they deserve a medal for their devotion to duty and their mates. Other roles among the ground crew included transport personnel, of which there were approximately 30 per squadron, who moved fuel, ammunition and men across an airfield. Five orderlies operated from mobile offices, typing casualty reports, aircraft damages and mission reports. It was also their job to set in motion the process of notifying next of kin in the event of a squadron death. There was also the squadron canteen, which operated from 9am to 8pm every day selling tobacco and cigarettes, chocolate, beer and other assorted foods. The profits here would go towards the next supply run to Alexandria. However, due to the small amounts of money possessed by airmen and ground crew alike, many of the customers were groups of two or three men putting money together to share in a beer. The biggest challenge in the conditions of the desert war was the desert itself. During the day, personnel could seek shelter whenever they could. Burns were a genuine concern, not only because of accidents with petrol, which were frequent, but also for the unsuspecting crew member who got burnt by the metal skin of an aircraft that had been left out in the sun. Then there was the sand, and the sandstorms that were severe enough for the ground planes to ground planes for more than three days straight. Sand got into everything, playing havoc on all aspects of life and work. For instance, sand in the fuel lines was a major problem for engine fitters, remedied by placing rags at the end of fuel lines and regular cleaning. Despite this, Flight Sergeant John Tom commented, how we got away with some of the things we did, it was against all principles of engineering. In these conditions, water was also a precious and restricted source. According to Corporal Robert Smith, personnel were only given enough water for drinking and shaving. Those who wished to wash their clothes would sometimes pinch aviation gasoline, which was frequent on an airfield, to get the grease out of their clothes. The desperation for water was severe enough for guards to be placed on water carts to prevent stealing. At times, personnel were required to work through the night, by the light of the moon or by torchlight, in temperatures below 5 degrees Celsius. It was a common occurrence during the night to hear the sound of bombing by aircraft, uh, enemy aircraft. Squadron leader Kenneth McRae noted that it took some time to get used to, but eventually became an accepted part of life. Sleeping involved personnel digging a small hole and throwing their overcoat over the top. Some would also use a tent to provide cover during the sandstorms. As the terrain became less sandy in the west in places like Matuba and Benghazi, personnel resorted to using piled rocks to make shelter. Of course, there was also sickness among the ground crew. The most common malady was boils, caused by a vitamin deficiency. Tablets were administered for this, but proved ineffectual. There was also sand eye that required medical officers to numb the eye and pick out sand with a thin metal instrument. Other medical issues included a form of dysentery known to personnel as gypotummy and sandfly fever caused by sandfly bites. As fighter squadrons in the desert war were required to move in accordance with the front line, so too did members of the ground crew experience sudden change in moving to new airfields on a regular basis. Squadron leader Bobby Gibbs commented that a little tented city would spring up and then disappear within a period of three hours. Especially during the retreats of 1941 and 1942 during Rommel's offensives, moving came, un moving came unexpectedly, requiring personnel to be ready to go at a moment's notice. John Thom commented that sometimes you never knew at 9 o'clock at night where you were going the next morning. You could be anything up to 200 kilometres away by the following evening. Squadrons moved in two parts, with the ground crew moving first and the pilots following after. Pilots were required to continue operations during these moves. And if the ground crew would move, and if the campaign was moving faster than anticipated, they would leapfrog to the next base and the ground crew would follow soon after. In some cases, it would be a month before the squadron was all together again. Such moves were not always smooth or pleasant. Gibbs wrote that the ground crew personnel had to travel hundreds of miles in extreme discomfort 
on open, dust-laden trucks, the hot sun drying up every drop of moisture from their aching bodies. Nor did it mean rest for these men. Wireless operators, such as Flight Sergeant Albert Pearson, were required to maintain communications with pilots on the move. This was made more difficult by the fact that their gear was attached to the vehicle, but would only operate if the vehicle was stopped, even then, on very little power. More often than not, these men would arrive at a new airfield and need to begin working immediately, whether it was on servicing aircraft or beginning to shovel sand to form a new airstrip, a fact that Bobby Gibbs likened their service to horses in the old cavalry period. Now, regarding the relationship between the ground crew and the pilots, the Desert War actually had a role in changing attitudes. Kenneth McRae, who enlisted in 1936, noted that there was a rank-conscious divide between the pilots and the ground crew prior to the outbreak of the Second World War. As Australians began operating in the desert, there was a positive change in attitudes during combat duties, which McRae reasoned that they seemed to realise that their lives depended on these boys, and they were much friendlier. Flight Sergeant Edmund Medhurst, a wireless operator, suggested that the pilots felt uncomfortable with somebody else working on their planes, and coming to trust the ground crew in turn helped them trust that their plane would be taken care of. Regardless, the bond between ground crew and pilots was forged despite the conditions imposed by war. Pilots and ground staff lived in separate tents and ate in different messes, but the change in relationship meant that pilots could be seen spending time with ground crew members in the evenings. This change also established a squadron identity in which the ground crew could see their efforts reflected in the victories of their pilots. Felix Sainsbury wrote that personnel took pride in their efforts to keep the planes in the best possible condition for their pilots, and in this saw their contribution to fighting the enemy. In a more literal sense, personnel would sometimes write messages on bombs after they were loaded, such as the one above. The ground crew would also go above and beyond to ensure that their pilots could be as efficient as possible in the air and come home safely. According to Edmund Medhurst, some personnel began waxing planes, which was thought to have created less wind resistance and gave the aircraft an extra five knots of speed, essentially five kilometres per hour. This proved invaluable for planes, especially in dogfights against the Messerschmitt Bf 109s, a common German aircraft which you can see today in Anzac Hall. The efforts of the ground crew were considered superhuman under the conditions of the war. Squadron leader Bobby Gibbs wrote that these men performed miracles day and night, carrying out their onerous tasks silently and cheerfully, and he likened every man to a cog in the machinery in the squadron's organisation. In an illustration of this perfect cooperation, Gibbs describes an instance where Number 3 Squadron had just moved to an abandoned yet heavily mined airfield in 1942. While the ground crew were clearing away the enemy mines, the fighter planes returned from operations. Gibbs wrote that every man, wireless, mechanic, fitters, riggers, and so on, went to work rearming, refueling, and bombing up, and they coolly ignored the mines. Despite this threat, which ultimately claimed five lives on this day, the ground crew managed to have their planes back in the air in less than 30 minutes. In another example... Number 3 Squadron was involved in an Allied offensive on the 23rd of November 1942, shortly after the Second Battle of El Alamein. While the planes served as both fighters and bombers, it was reported that the ground crew were working up to 20 hours a day, serving the squadron, servicing the squadron planes and maintaining a high serviceability rate. At night, despite the long hours and freezing temperatures, Gibbs noted that mechanics could be seen continuing to service aircraft, Armourers continuing to rearm the planes and service guns by torchlight. And wireless operators continuing to tinker with instruments long after the average man had gone to sleep. In their spare time and when on leave, there were several activities for personnel to enjoy. As they were in a foreign country, the major activity of choice was tourism, which for the most part depended on the squadron's location at the time of leave. When the fighter squadrons were in Syria, for example, in 1941, personnel could visit Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. When in Egypt, they could visit the Pyramids of Giza, the Steppe Pyramid near Helwan, and the city of Memphis where archaeological excavations continued despite the threat of war. Further west, they could also visit Roman ruins, such as Number 450 Squadron sending 50 personnel to visit the ruins at Cyrene in December 1942. Personnel could also take the opportunity to have a day at the beach 
and swim in the Mediterranean Sea as both a source of bathing and recreation. But the most popular attraction was Alexandria, which personnel could only really visit if the squadron was based in Egypt or especially at an airfield near Amariah, close to the city. Alexandria was a hotspot for clubbing and dancing, music and alcohol, which you can imagine was pretty scarce on an airfield, as well as more shady indulgences, such as brothels. The ground crew in Australia's fighter squadrons endured a complex experience of the Desert War. While everyone in the squadron, both pilot and ground crew, endured the harsh conditions of the desert, such as the heat and the sand, the experience of the ground crew was shaped by the multitude of roles the personnel played. This ranged from the men who were directly responsible for the maintenance of planes, such as the wireless fitters, oh, sorry, the wireless operators and the fitters, as well as the more generic roles like the cooks. There are many more jobs that have been noted in sources, which I intend to explore further in my essay. But it is due to these differing roles that their experience was unique to their work. For example, while an engine fitter would deal with sand in the fuel lines, a cook would be dealing with making sure that the food didn't taste like sand. The defining point of their experience, I argue, is their perseverance in the face of the desert war and their devotion to keeping the planes flying. This was directly influenced by the bond that was forged between the ground crew and the pilots. It created a squadron identity and for the ground crew, a shared sense of victory, which allowed morale to remain consistently high. This was even reflected back home, summarized in the RAAF's Christmas album of 1943. They never failed, even though working under conditions that in peacetime would have been considered impossible and the aircraft kept flying. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, any questions? Uh, thanks for that presentation, Nick. Um, I'm just wondering in your research whether you've come across any uh, ways in which the Australian ground crew were different from other um, allied uh, uh, ground crew doing the same jobs in the same area in terms of experience or, or culture or equipment or, or that sort of thing. Um, not specifically by nationality. Um, when I started this, my intention was to do a variety more of the ground crew um, in the fighter squadrons. Um, however, due to the availability of sources, I decided to narrow down on the fighters specifically. Um, the experience was pretty much different between nationalities, um, or at least between what their roles were, where they were, and very much like that. Um, but off the top of my head, I would not know. Wow, tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, Nick. Thanks for that. Um, I was going to ask a question about... You mentioned the injuries and the burns and things that some of the ground crew suffered, particularly the ones working on the planes. And I'm wondering about the morale. Like, I imagine the morale between the people who worked on one aircraft was quite tight. If one of those people had to be, you know, medically evacuated or something like that, did you find anything about the change in morale and, and the way that the ground crews formed those bonds in those tough conditions? Well, thank you for that, random stranger. Okay. <laughs> um, I did, actually, yeah. Um, a lot of what I've been reading has been um, uh, journals and interview transcripts. And... Um, there, is, there was a lot about talking about injuries, um, particularly Felix Sainsbury. Um, he noted a lot of, um, you know, every day someone gets accidentally shot, someone gets crashed in a plane. Um, it didn't really have that much of an effect on morale. It happened. Um, I would wager that this was because of the expectant mentality, which I noticed with the relationship between the pilots and the ground crew. Um, a lot of their friendships and the bonds that they made came with this baggage that the pilot was going to die basically so as much as a lot of these uh, some pilots did continue their friendships after the war had ended um they also when they were at the, in the desert war they would be like they would be very much you know if he dies okay he's dead i'll make a new friend and in that case yeah um 
there were a lot of there were people evacuated and it did it did damper morale but it didn't damper it to the extent where they were questioning their their contribution or questioning whether or not they should be there so yeah uh, the ground crews, uh, are the pilots rotated through the squadrons and um, changed squadrons after the end of their tours and stuff like that. Did the ground crew stick with the squadrons when they went on to Italy or did some of them come back to Australia and um, serve in the Pacific? That's a good question. Um, bo they both. Um, a ma majority of them did stay with ground crew um, after 19... At the beginning of 1943, um, so the Desert War ended May 1943. Beginning of the invasion of Sicily began July 1943. In those two months, both squadrons moved to Malta to continue their operations there. Uh, a majority of the ground crew did stay. However, some did come back to Australia and serve either as instructors for uh, future pilots and ground crew or even uh, postings to new squadrons and continuing to operate in the Pacific theatre, specifically uh, Milne Bay and uh, New Guinea. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks, Nick. Um, you've been talking about the relations between uh, pilots and ground crew, um, and in those terms, pilots, ground crew, but I, I wondered, um, do they overlay class differences in any way? And are there any... Have you come across evidence of, you know, I'm thinking of class differences in, in civilian life and whether they're carried over to the rela relations you've been talking about? That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, not that I've seen specifically. Um, a lot of these guys came from, some of them had a lot of previous experience. Um, uh, one of the, the guy who operated the squadron canteen, uh, he was a baker before he moved to the ground crew. Um, some of them did a lot of apprenticeships in fitting. Um, in regards to the pilots, I'm not really sure in their experience. I did look at some, but I've mainly focused on the experiences of ground crew. Um, but thank you for that question. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, guys. Great work, Nick. Thank you very much for that uh, exploration of what was happening in the desert on the ground. Our next speaker this morning is Catherine Smith. She has joined us uh, from her honours year at the University of Newcastle. And this year she'll be beginning um, the collaborative PhD um, program at the Australian National University here in Canberra in collaboration with the National Film and Sound Archive. Now, Catherine Smith had, um, and I should have said, Nick was supervised by Dr. Lachlan Grant and Dr. Carl James. That was remiss of me. Uh, Catherine had um, Malia Hampton from the, the section as her supervisor, but unfortunately, due to uh, some sickness, on, uh, some sick leave that Mel took, Catherine wound up being sort of supervised by a whole bunch of people in the section and pushed and pulled with different advice from different people. Um, and so it showed remarkable persistence in piecing together this narrative that you're going to hear about the Battle of Mont St. Quentin. So can we welcome Catherine? And thank you to my myriad of you know, supervisors. I appreciated all the help. All right. The Battle of Monson Quinton, one of the final engagements of the first AIF, was a quick and nasty fight. Despite its brevity, the battle earned a significant reputation. Lieutenant Colonel William Brazner of the 23rd Battalion reported it to be one of the best the brigade has participated in. Brigadier General Evan Wisdom of the 7th Brigade described the fight as one of the most brilliant achievements of his unit. Commander of the Australian Corps, Lieutenant General Sir John Monash, noted that he was sure that the battle would become a classic of military literature. The slopes of the Mont sparked the avid interest of journalists, artists, memorialists, historians and politicians. <laughs> 
The capture of Mont Saint-Quentin was an astonishing achievement for the men who fought it and a substantial victory for the Allies. Understrength battalions, bold and courageous deeds, a well-defended objective of strategic importance. The battle, according to the literature and to witnesses, was one of the finest feats of the First World War. It was recognised as such then and is recognised as such now. From 1915 to 1917, the Western Front was mostly a static field of battle. By 1918, Quartermaster General Eric Ludendorff gambled that a series of decisive blows could bring the Allies to heel. In March, the spring offensive began. In a series of assaults, German forces advanced nearly 100 kilometres west to this line. Despite this success, Ludendorff's divisions were soon desperately undermanned, under-resourced and overextended. The 100 Days Offensive followed, a series of Allied victories which concluded with the armistice. All of the efforts of the Australian Corps during the 100 Days took place within this area. And it is here that we can find Mont Quinton. The Australian Corps swept through this area in a matter of days in late August and early September. Their rapid easterly advance, however, was obstructed by a number of key features. Firstly, the Somme River and Canal, a series of villages and woods, the town of Peron on the, on the northern bank, and finally, Mont Saint Quentin. Standing 100 metres above the Somme, the hill was a nest of trenches, machine guns and sentry positions swarming with German soldiers. The advancing force was commanded by Lieutenant General Sir John Monash. To hasten the German retreat, he determined to take Mont Saint Quentin at speed. He was eager that this victory be attributed to his corps. In his own words, this should be an Australian victory. His corps belonged to Field Marshal Haig's British Expeditionary Force, more specifically, General Sir Henry Rawlinson's Fourth Army. When Rawlinson was told of Monash's plans, he was dubious. He exclaimed, so you think you're going to take Monson Quinton with three battalions? What presumption? However, I don't think I ought to stop you, so go ahead and try and I wish you luck. Of Monash's five divisions, the third were to hold the left flank and the fifth the right. The second, led by Major General Charles Rosenthal, were to take the Mont. The second division had begun to mobilise on the 25th of August. The journey started out by foot, some 25 kilometres distant from the Mont, through terrain like this. Patrols had to clear every wood, every trench, every village. In their retreat, German units corrupt, uh, corrupted wells, they mined roads, they shifted railway sleepers to render the line useless. From the 29th, the enemy was closely pursued to the river where they destroyed all local bridges. Engineers and pioneers labored, often under direct fire, on repairs. By the 30th, the Corps was again on the move. For the Australian soldiers arriving on the northern banks, the prospect of taking the Mont was an intimidating one they could see that the German defences were substantial. They could see rusting belts of wire and the well-established machine gun positions. They could see that the bare ground offered minimal cover. Concealed positions like this one protected German snipers and machine gunners as they fired onto possible approaches. After receiving rum rations, the 5th started up the Mont at 5 a.m. on the 31st, Wanting to fool the enemy into believing that they were a bigger force than they actually were, they hollered and cooeyed as they approached the enemy positions. One soldier observed, one would have thought this was a stockyard broke loose. They made rapid progress. Indeed, they were so quick that one captured German prisoner said it was all the work of an instant. They gained their objectives but were soon forced by a counterattack to a lower position on the Mont. Pockets of resistance held up further up in trenches and dugouts like these. The 6th, waiting in reserve, were ordered to relieve the 5th early the following morning. Their approach was met with strong resistance. Here, men from the 21st stooped down as they traverse a road swept by machine gun fire. It was in conditions like these that three men of the 2nd Division would win Victoria Crosses. Lieutenant Towner, Sergeant Lowison and Private McTeer all conducted attacks on machine gun posts under heavy fire, successfully neutralising positions which were preventing the Australian advance. As these deeds were taking place, large amounts of German prisoners were flowing down the hill. Here they arrive at the rear for processing. By mid-morning, 
By mid-morning, progress had stagnated. An artillery barrage of half an hour commenced at one o'clock. Men hunkered in trenches and shell holes, similarly to these members of the 24th. At 1.30, the offence resumed. This photograph shows the 21st, a unit brought forward from reserve to compensate for the day's casualties, commencing their charge. They were soon successful in securing the Mont. They took to clearing the village of remaining resistance. Private Morris of the 20th confiscated a canister of coffee from a German doctor and soon found himself very popular with his jubilant comrades who thought he was serving rum. <laughs> Activity on the first line continued for the second division until the 4th of September. As, a, as the Australians mopped up pockets of resistance and they conducted flank support. Here, the 7th Division approached their positions to continue the advance into Peron. The feats performed by the Australian Corps at Mont St Quintin are indisputably substantial and were against all the odds. During the nine days in the line, seven were spent fighting. 15,141 acres were captured, as well as over 1,000 1, and a half... Uh, excuse me, as over one and a half thousand prisoners. The terrain was brutal and unforgiving, as well as closely guarded by German soldiers who had the advantage of preparation and the high ground. The men adapted to circumstances in the field and took positions at an almost unprecedented speed. The performance of these troops far outstripped commander expectations. This was a well-decorated battle, which earned conspicuous recognition for many of its soldiers. And most crucially, this battle was a major blow to the enemy. The Germans lost a significant amount of men and valuable assets, as well as a key strategic defence point on the Somme. The reasons for Mont St Quintin's significance in the historical landscape are numerous. The battle, the so-called finest feat of the war, was an astounding achievement. It could also have been one of the costliest blunders of the Hundred Days. Rushed orders delivered in the early morning hours of the morning, insufficient artillery support, dangerously fatigued men. If you look closely at planning and orders, resourcing, and the demands placed on troops, you will see decisions which endangered the entire operation. These were gambles and oversights that could have easily rendered this success an utter disaster. Monash made a rash and unnecessary decision to take the Mont. Official war historian Charles Bean, concerned about the growing death toll incurred by the Australian Corps during the Hundred Days, noted in his diary that by this time, there was a feeling that there may no longer be a Dominion Army left soon. He felt that this was due, excuse me, he felt that this was due at least in part to Monash's lack of care for judging which engagements were vital and which were not. While Bean was by no means Monash's greatest fan, this observation is revealing of Monash's demanding ambitions for his corps. While casualties were mounting, Monash was seeking out victories, writing in a letter two weeks prior to the battle that his units were piling success upon success. However, his run was soon drawing to a close. At a conference on the 26th of August, Monash was told by his superior officers that the 4th Army had done its share and it was soon to await orders elsewhere. Rawlinson, Monash's direct superior, had informed him that, uh, that there was no object in hasting the Germans' withdrawal and ordered him to do no more than keep touch with the enemy. A major push by the 3rd Army to the north and the advance of the 1st Army to the south were now to become the primary focus of the BEF's operations. Keeping touch meant simply keeping pressure on the enemy without any costly engagements. Nevertheless, Monash had looked to advice from Haig that the time had come to act energetically and without hesitation. These were the words that he took to heart. When Monash revealed his intentions to take the Mont despite his advice, Rawlinson laughed at his cheek and explained that he had no expectations of success. Despite his well-founded doubts regarding the capability of the severely diminished units to take the objective, he still agreed to let him try. While the capture of the Mont would come to be considered a noteworthy achievement for Monash and his corps, it certainly was not an essential one. The hasty attack was at the expense of the meticulous planning that Monash had built his reputation on. The preparation for the battle was inadequate and this insufficiency dictated the soldiers' experience on the ground. Orders formed in evening conferences at headquarters were issued, then rescinded, then replaced. Timings turned on a dime, Coordination of movements and resources occurred on the run. 
Often orders were not given in writing due to the rapidity of movement, and as such, the majority of commands occurred over the telephone, often in the early hours of the morning. These conditions were characteristic of the 2nd Division's time on the line during this tour, though the Battle of Mont St Quentin was certainly the worst instance of this level of unpreparedness. Brigadier General Wisdom complained that the delayed orders meant that his commanders only had just time to get their companies and move to the jumping off line. There were times when machine gun companies were not notified of the movements of their battalions. Sometimes reconnaissance was weak and reporting was inaccurate. Lieutenant Clayton of the 23rd argued that if the trenches at the base of the Mont had been empty as was stated, the task of arriving at the jumping off point by zero hour would have been comparatively easy. Instead, the position was strongly defended by the enemy. These demanding conditions were all the more punishing considering troop fatigue. This exhaustion was present from the earliest stages of mobilisation and it was caused by the rush nature of the battle. Some soldiers, having been on the move for days at a time, would, uh, at a time without rest, would drop when told to stand down, sleeping for sometimes only minutes before being ordered forward. There are reports of men who fell asleep on embankments, leaning forward and almost drowning themselves in their cups of tea. As a point of reference, sleep deprivation of 28 hours and above impairs motor and cognitive performance to the same degree as a blood alcohol reading of 0.1%. Conducting flank support to the north, the 38th Battalion had been marching and fighting for 84 hours without break when they took the village of Cleary. In other words, the soldiers fighting this battle were experiencing impaired memory and reasoning function and reduced reaction speeds. In conducting the extremely mentally and physically challenging task of combat, these soldiers were at a significant disadvantage before they even encountered the enemy. In addition to insufficient planning and fatigued men, the hasty attack did not allow for the adequate build-up of artillery. Heavy artillery companies were immediately discounted from participation due to their distance from the line. What light artillery support was available was inadequate to establish a creeping barrage. Instead, positions of strategic importance were selected and bombed in rising sequence following the progress of the infantry up the hill. Here you can see the field artillery and machine gun barrage maps of the Battle of Hamel, perhaps Monash's most well-known victory. Note the regimented steps set out in almost excruciating levels of detail. Each of these lines represents a meticulously timed and sustained field of fire, carefully spaced one after the other. In striking contrast, samples of maps from Monson Quinton. These hurried blobs were all that the artillery men had to go on when organising the barrage of the Mont. Fire was restricted to these small zones at two rounds per gun per minute, a rate half of firing capacity. The approach to the position had been so quick that ammunition dumps were poorly supplied. As such, the barrage was to be maintained only as long as supply would allow. This is a far cry from Hamel, when 132,000 rounds of field artillery ammunition were fired in 90 minutes during the creeping barrage alone. Comparatively, the barrage of the Mont was described as thin and spasmodic in multiple reports, while some soldier accounts document the barrage falling short and mingling with German shells fired on Australian positions. This may speak to poor sighting or worn barrels or inadequately surveyed and prepared firing positions. The hurried nature of the attack did not allow for the recognition of any of these problems, much less the rectification of them. The inadequate bombardment also meant that many defensive positions were still intact as Australians advanced. Dozens of approaches were blocked by heavy fortifications. Uniforms and boots were torn to ribbons by wires and enfilading fire caused casualties as units became caught in the open. Approaching a machine gun position, Lieutenant Guard of the 20th supervised as his men timed gaps in heavy fire to jump into an approaching, uh, in, a, in an advancing trench. He lamented at the timing, a number of good fellows missed it. The casualties experienced at Monson Quinton were heavy, some 3,000 men all told. Before the battle began, the Australian Corps was already a dramatically understrength force. A battalion when raised is comprised of 1,000 men. By this time, the Australian Corps battalions averaged just 653 troops. The battalions of the 5th Brigade, the vanguard on the Mont, averaged just 312. 
Determined to secure the position, Monash told Commander of the 3rd Division, Major General John Gellibrand, that casualties no longer matter. Let me show you what this means. On August 31st, Lieutenant Smythe of the 24th was organising his unit at the base of the Mont. Sergeant Jim Collery remarked while passing his position at dusk that there were dead and wounded in a trench on the left flank. Smythe, horrified that his men had been left as they fell, scrambled to the scene. He later remarked, it was the kind of thing that leaves an impress stamped on the mind forever. The trench had been hit by a 9.2 inch heavy artillery shell. As Smythe and his men approached, there was silence. But as the living realised that these were Australians and they were here to help, they began to moan and cry. Smythe wrote, the carnage was awful, dead, wounded and dying, all lay huddled and twisted together in a grotesque little heaps in a mass of mangled flesh. A right arm clung to a shoulder by a strip of skin. The soldier begged Smythe to cut the limb off and he attempted to do so with a jackknife but could not manage it. Another soldier's knees were completely shattered. He asked, how are my legs? I can't feel them and requested that someone hand him his own rifle so that he could blow his brains out. He then died of his wounds. The worst of those alive was a man whose legs had been taken off below the knees, right arm shattered from wrist to shoulder, head lacerated and covered in blood. He asked plaintively, when are they going to take me away? Having tended to the wounded until nightfall, Smythe set about identifying the dead by taking papers from pockets and identity discs from necks. In the dark, he recognised the gleam of a brass A affixed to a sleeve, a symbol of service at Gallipoli. This badge belonged to Company Quartermaster, Quartermaster Sergeant Victor James Jolly, a decent sort of chap who had enlisted on the 13th of March 1915 and was carrying photographs of his mother in his pocket on the day he died. This is what the Battle of Monson Quinton cost. A loss of experience, a loss of material, a loss of men. By his own account, Monash thought of battle as a symphony where the various arms and units are the instruments, where each unit must play its part in the general harmony. He had very few of these instruments at Monson Quinton, yet he committed the resources he did have to keep in the game. Monson Quinton is often described as the finest feat of the war. Far from Monash's achievement, it was a soldier's battle, one defined by the accomplishments and sacrifices of the men who were forced to fight it. None of the shortcomings of Monash's planning, orders and resourcing can diminish the achievements of these soldiers. Their success, despite these circumstances, is a testament to their proficiency and courage, not his leadership. This was a soldier's battle. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Katie. Any questions? It is a tough crowd. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, during your research, did you find that there was much, uh, what was the general feeling of the troops post battle, I suppose, um, towards Monash's planning? Was there animosity? Was there uh, a feeling of pride in their achievement? What was the general sort of res backlash, I suppose, if you, un if you understand? That's a great question, mm. thank you. Um, there was substantial pride in the victory. The soldiers repeatedly commented on in the personal documentation that this was something that they even recognised was substantial in terms of the 100 days, in terms of all of their achievements during the whole war. In terms of personal animosity towards Monash, there wasn't anything that was specific towards him. In fact, there wasn't really a, like orders come from on high, they come from command and who's made those decisions and when, um, at least at that level, I did not notice very much um, commentary other than sort of complaints about we've been on the move for a long time. Um, we didn't get hot dinner tonight. Like we didn't, we're not having showers. We're sort of in the open, you know, it's very uncomfortable and that kind of thing. So in terms of anything personal in the records, documenting any animosity that the soldiers had towards Monash, 
Um, not not specifically. Um, there's some, there's an interesting case of a particular man um, who was killed on the Mont, and his father became really invested in researching. Peter Stanley's book, The Men of Mont St. Quentin, details that story um, really well. And and one of the things he notices is that. Um, this father, as he's documenting this experience of grieving, he then starts to become a little sceptical of was this necessary? Did this battle need to happen? Um, but off the top of my head, that's the only example I can kind of think of sort of a civilian or a soldier thinking that way, if that makes sense. Okay. Thanks, Katie. Um, I'm Elise. I work with the art section Hi. here. I think we met the other week. We did. Um, I was wondering if you could um, tell us about the artists whose work, sure. um, yeah, who you researched and how did they represent the battle and the Mont? Yeah, the, um, the artists were there really, they arrived on the scene quite soon after the battle was over. The lovely picture you saw of um, crouching in the rubble and sort of had his suitcase open and was painting on the inside of his suitcase. That happened, I think, only three or four days after the, the battle had actually occurred. Uh, they were still clearing, to give you a, some picture, they were still clearing bodies from the Mont at that point. Um, so we have four major uh, art official war historians who painted the Mont. Um, we, there's actually some, doc, like there's a, there's a point of contention about how steep they represented the sides of the Mont uh, in terms of, you know, you look at some of the photographs, it looks really flat. And I've actually had a number of people who've walked on the Mont talk about how flat it seems as you're walking up. By the time you get to the top, Every, you can see everything and that's why it was so important in terms of strategy to have that position. But yeah, there's some manipulation in some of the artwork about how steep you actually see the sides of the Mont to be because you sort of hear about this battle and you're like, that's an amazing achievement, well done Australia. And then you look at the picture and it's like that. And it's like, oh, that's not, that's not that impressive. Um, so they've sort of manipulated it in that way. I didn't, I would have loved to research more about this process of representation um, and it's something that, like I'd love to look more into but it just in terms of that's the kind of only tidbit I had about that particular process I hope that's helpful hey, Brian Dawson I missed your first part of your um, lecture unfortunately not a worry it's on um, YouTube it'll be on YouTube <laughs> did, did you uh, um, what was the German intention? Was was it a uh, a delaying battle from their perspective mm -hmm. that they wanted to hold say for 24, 48 hours mm -hmm. and then sort of fall back, or did they uh, were they looking to make a stand um, at Mont Saint Quentin, which, as as I understand, has kind of been historically quite a strategic feature in the, the many wars between um, Germany and France. There was an intention to hold it. They knew how important it was strategically and they wanted to hold it. You can see um, in this sort of quick advance to the river and then crossing and getting up onto the Mont, um, the Germans weren't able to take back quite a number of significant pieces of artillery. They left it behind, just forced by that rapid progress. So, you know, a lot of the orders and sort of now in we have the access to the German orders from that time sort of saying this is an important spot and we want to hold it for as long as possible. So whether or not they believe they could hold it for any significant amount of time, I'm not sure. But in terms of that immediate intention, it was to hold it for as long as possible. They reinforced with sort of bits and pieces from five different German divisions. And that's who the Australians met on the Mont. Um, but they were reinforced by some really quite well known and well feared German regiments. Um, so they, they, especially at the top of the Mont, towards the bottom, there's sort of a lot of surrender happening and a lot of, you know, demoralised German troops from battalions that aren't as well known, who were surrendering quite quickly. But then up on the top of the Mont, you find a lot of fierce resistance from these well-respected German regiments. So I believe that the intention was to hold it for as long as possible with the knowledge that the Hindenburg line was there and that if it had to happen, that that retreat could occur if, if necessary. You're welcome. I, Hi. I, I just wondering, when, you, when you were making that point about um, Monash trying to sell his plans to the British commanders who mm -hmm. were a bit sceptical, yeah. uh, I was just wondering if you find any personal notes in Monash's records or commanders working for him that they, they knew about his engineering background and experience and that may have given them confidence in him being able to pull it off, but the British maybe... Didn't didn't know that yet because Monash was an experienced engineer before yes. he, on um, before his military service. Mm -hmm. So, maybe that bit of difference they weren't. They certainly. This, the achievements of Monash up to this date, like, you know, there were a lot of congratulations. There's this great 
note in Monash's diary, something along the lines of, oh, Birdwood came over to see me today and, um, you know, he had lots of congratulations and he even made a comment, something along the lines of like, oh, look at all you've been able to achieve. I, I might not have been able to achieve that same amount in the time that you've had. So, you know, well done and all that sort of thing. The British command... I mean, you look at the Battle of Hamel and you look at the level of detail that went into the planning of that battle and it's an unmitigated success. Like the casualty rates are low, the coordination goes off without a hitch. Like it's just, it's, it's a success. It's a, it's a, a well-renowned victory for a really good reason. Um, in terms of their faith in him, in terms of knowing his engineering background, I'm not quite sure on that point whether or not they... they I imagine they, they were quite well known to each other. So I imagine that they did know that he was an engineer in his previous life, like previous life before the military, before World War I. Um, but whether or not that played into their trust of him in terms of planning the battle, organising the battle, I think that's more demonstrated in his previous successes, on particularly during the 100 days, but previously to that as well. Um, but yeah, he was a, a well-known and well-respected by his sort of superiors. And I think that also plays into the fact that Rawlinson allowed him to do it at all. You know, there was not this level of planning and he trusted him to do it anyway. Um, and, it, and it was a gamble, but it, and it did happen to come off, yeah. The risk being that there are so many factors that meant that it really could have been a disaster. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Catherine. That was fantastic. Well done to all three of you. Could I, could I get a round of applause for all three of our scholars? <laughs> and I'd like to uh, invite the, the acting director, Brian Dawson, to come up and, and all three scholars to come up onto the stage uh, for the presentation of certificates. Sure. Thank you very much, scholars. Thank you, Brian, for presenting those certificates. And thank you all for coming along and supporting our Summer Scholars Program. I'm sure you'll agree with me that it was a very uh, impressive round of talks that we had this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs>